Did you hear that? One of yep. the most one of the most ubiquitous sounds for northern and eastern and parts of southern Australia. Yes. It is, of course, the masked lapwing. Now, why does a podcast about threatened and endangered birds feature somebody who's just done a bunch of research on the masked lapwing, or as old people like me will know it, the spurwing plover. Alona Sharuvi. Now, tell me how I'm supposed to pronounce your name. I'm originally from Israel. I've lived here in Australia almost 15 years. So my, I know my name is a little bit weird to pronounce, but the correct pronunciation is Kharuvi. I think only Israelis and Dutch people can do that, or anyone from the Middle East, to be honest, but Australians are fine. Thank you for allowing me to ozify your name. That's fine. Alona, you're at, at Deakin Uni, and you've produced a nice paper about the stresses and the behavioural responses for the masked lapwing. Now, Let's talk, tell us first about the masked lapwing. For those who are not familiar with us, tell us about why it's such an intriguing bird. Let me start with, first of all, I have a soft spot for angry birds. Anything that is aggro, I think it's fantastic. But lapwing, there's currently a, a trend of decline of shorebirds. It's a global decline. Mass lapwings, currently they are very ubiquitous that you can see them especially in the north to southeast coast and the thing is that even though that they're common they may be in decline and we don't know it but also in in my study me and my supervisory team we used mass lapwings as a model bird to identify behavioural and physiological responses to uh, stress and basically living around humans, which is something that is affecting all birds and especially shorebirds, is going to just increase. Like People like living by the coast and building nice houses and that affects all shorebirds, including mass lapwings. And, of course, in... Australia, we have the emblematic hooded plover, but you know, in the Americas, there's the the piping plover. We've got New Zealand have got a couple of plovers or dotterels which are on the decline. There, the west certainly... coast of the US have the snowy plovers. The yeah, so the, so so that's the reason for for including you, apart from an initiative which is to get a bunch of scientists out on the airwaves. To actually yes. do a bit more psychom, do, do you want to talk about the that program? Yes, of course. First of all, I'm very grateful to be here because being able to, like, as a scientist, and and I think it's something to do with all scientists. And you also spoke the other day with Fiona. We, we don't get a chance to talk about what we're passionate about. We just go out in the field, we do our thing, and. Sometimes we find that it's it's very hard to reach the public and tell them why it's important what we do. So Pines of Science is a global movement that there's a festival every May around the world. It's an amazing platform for scientists from all fields of science, from social sciences to medicine to, to e- ecology. It's a great platform to actually get the public in the same room with scientists and give us that platform to talk about what we do and why it's important and how it affects other people's lives. And I think it's a fantastic project. I volunteered in it last year. And this year, I got this opportunity to come and talk about my research, which is fantastic. The world's going to eat it up, no doubt. And, and I'm very grateful to, to the team in Australia, the Pine of Science in Australia. We've done, like, they've done an amazing job this year and last year adapting to the whole COVID thing because we were just having started to organize pubs and places for people to talk and then bang everything closed down and yeah and of course i'm very grateful to the management team of pint of science and led in particular for introducing us so that's fantastic maybe next year we can be sitting in a room with a panel or something and doing quest questions and answers and all those fun things but 
Alona, tell us what how do you define yourself as a scientist? What what's your specialty and what's your pathway been? Ooh, that's a good question. It's uh, interesting I, because people who I, I, I try and get this point across. People think that you sent me a couple of emails and at the bottom of it there's a little Deakin University logo. Now, just a cursory glance, you think you've got an office at Deakin and you've got a job, job there, but you're a sessional and your work is is limited. And so you need to be casting about to earn your bucks from science in a number of different ways. And most academics nowadays have to do this. And that's why SCICOM, as, as it's labelled now, is really important because you need to do media, you need to be getting a book deal, you need to be appearing on podcasts, you need to be a guest on the BBC or something to help drive other opportunities that will actually pay you money. Yeah, and also I think all these scientists, like all the ecologists that I've met, they're doing it out of sheer passion. So, yes, you need to make money, and it's very difficult these days, to be honest, especially with COVID. A lot of the funding has relocated from ecology and conservation to other things justifiably or not it really doesn't matter it's just that's how it is and a lot of us are are doing this because we are we, we truly believe that we can make a difference and that there is something that we can do about conservation and we can make the world a better place so yes it, it is a fantastic way to to get our word out there to have podcasts such as this one and have a festival like the Pine of Science because we need to keep afloat because because we want to do more work. You've got to pay rent like everybody else. So. Alana, just just tell us about the your journey, voyage, horrible word, I hate saying journey, from Israel to Australia and set up how you started your work on the on the lap wing. I keep wanting to call it a plover. It's just 30 years of knowing it, it. but 30 years of knowing it as a plover. I know it's wrong, but it's just, yes. By the way, this is one of the plights of the hooded plover because a lot of people think the hooded plover, even though it's threatened, they think it's the lap wing and they say, oh, but there's there's plovers everywhere. And that's one of the things that, yeah. Well, it used to be the hooded dotterel. So the brand identity issue didn't exist. But so, yeah. Those, look, all those say. genetic breakthroughs and stuff like that, that just changes like the, the classification. I, and it's really hard to keep up with that. But yeah. Maybe the the hooded plover recovery team needs to change its name to brand management team or something. So, yeah, look, I know before you were working with the lapwings, you were working with penguins. So let's let's cover that ground. Oh, it's actually the other way around. The other- yeah. So so I'll tell you a bit about myself. I came to Australia. This is my second career. Like I used to be an IT person. And one day after I was working in IT in different companies and and doing system administration and stuff like that, I decided to go back to uni and do something that I care about. And I went to Deakin and studied wildlife and conservation biology. And I loved it so much that I decided that I have to continue my studies because I really enjoyed the research and I really enjoyed feeling like I'm using my skills and my brain to, to, to solve problems. And yeah, and following that, because I've done my research, my honours project on lap wings, and I'd done it at Phillip Island, then I got to, with collaboration of Phillip Island Nature Parks and my other supervisor from my supervisory team is from Deakin, it's Dr. Mike Weston, who's anyone in the shorebird industry knows who Mike Weston is. And from Nature Parks, that collaboration was with Dr. Peter Dan, who's the director of the research team at Phillip Island Nature Parks. 
So when I finished my project and submitted my thesis, I started working at the Penguin Parade and volunteered a lot doing research and everything. And then I got fortunate enough to become a research technical officer at the research team. So that was a good thing. Now, Phillip Island Nature Parks, is that an amalgamation of what used to be like? There was a Swan Lake Reserve and there's the... Penguin Parade area, and then there's the fringe area, Seal Rocks and the Nobbies, and where all the shearwaters come in. And there was actually a place that was called a nature park, which was where you would go and cuddle a kangaroo and whatnot. Are they all together or are they not all? I know. I think that Wildlife Park, it's called Phillip Island Wildlife Park, I think. And that's where you cuddle the wallabies. Phillip Island Nature Parks is a a non-for-profit organisation that was tasked by the government to manage all the crown lands on Phillip Island. So does that include Churchill Island and that reserve at Real and and then that? Yeah, and the seal colony. So we manage all the open spaces that are not private, including beaches. So the main bread and butter is the Penguin Parade, which and, and Phillip Island Nature Parks has a very interesting model of ecotourism. So when people come in, the tickets are basically paying for conservation, for the conservation work that we do. And we do a lot of restoration of vegetation. And, of course, there's the where the penguin colony sits in Summerlands, which is... One of the most amazing conservation stories in Australia because the government bought back a whole suburb to have the penguins hang out. And it's a 30-year, multi-million dollar project. Yeah, and of course there's seal rocks with where you have the opportunity to observe the seal colony. Look, I, I actually grew up across the water from Ventnor. So I used to ride my bike. I used to get the ferry across and ride my bike around Phillip Island and whatnot. So really fond childhood memories of all of those areas, but it's probably 10 years since I since I went. Oh, you should come for a visit. (laughs) I will, but I, I, I want to say to anybody that when all the borders are open and you can travel and if you are coming to Melbourne or coming to Victoria, you must go to the Penguin Parade, you must visit Phillip Island because if you have any interest in birds, there is a lot to see. There's a real, around Churchill Island is fantastic and that's all uh, reserved. You'll see lots of waders and, and shorebirds around there. You've got a bay, one side of the island is a bay and then on the other side is Bass Strait, the ocean, and the chances of seeing some interesting seabirds is always there. And and then you've got things like the white-fronted chats buzzing around the island as well. Uh, Lots of things that you don't see as a rule on the mainland around there. And look, who knows, you might even see an OBP. Who knows? I'm still looking. I'm still looking for an OBP. But I did get a chance to see a ruddy turnstone, which is one of my favourite shorebirds because they're just so funky and there's a really beautiful colony of fairy terns down that way towards real on on that Um, base yeah and a swan the swan lake reserve is pretty interesting yeah reed warblers and sister collars and stuff like that and yes yeah i used to yeah we're bird nerds and we nerd out and anyone who's not into it is turned off and that's okay by me because that's what that is fine. Sorry again for reminiscing too much, dear listener, but I, no, Phil, Phillip Island is underappreciated by birdos. And to drive, uh, I think because to drive there is such a long way, do what I used to do as a kid put your bike on the ferry and catch the train down from Melbourne all the way down to Stony Point, get on the ferry, get across to Cows, and spend a couple of days just cruising around with your binoculars and your camera and you will have a great time. So, all right, let's get back to you. That <laughs> was a good tangent on Phillip Island, but it's really nice to, you know, it's really nice that that area is so well. It's fantastic. So It's just great. Western Port, 
Western Port is amazing. The mix of habitats from the western side, the north with the mudflats, the mangroves, string, the stringy bark sort of woodland around the fringe. You've got heathland. The mona trees. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. it's And most people just drive past it and don't notice. That Bass Coast area is Grantville and Bass. Yeah. My, the cliffs around there. You, you, you never know what you will see down there. And it's a stunning piece of country. Like, mm. really, mm. It's, it's stunning. And then, of course, there's seals. So There's seals. Yes. The seals and they're adorable and they're awesome. And although this is a bird emergency, but they are in danger as well because of entanglements and plastic and bad fishing habits. And so. Now, let me get a plug in. Episode one, okay. episode one of the bird emergency, the plastic warrior, Steph Burrell. If you're interested in this, in the issues with plastic and seabirds and sea, everything in the sea. Go back and listen to episode one, which well we did do. a long, which we did a long time ago. But yeah, but Steph's uh, Steph's the plastic warrior from, and yeah, listen. All right, well, we haven't worked out how you got from Israel to Australia. I just I had the opportunity, and I, and I got a permanent residency along with my um, ex partner, and we just decided to. Yeah come here and have a go and spend a couple of years and just leave overseas for a little bit to experience something different. I'm a very avid traveler, so I like experiencing new places. And I got here and I just fell in love with Australia. And and I saw so many things that I never thought I would see. Like first time I saw a possum, I was just shocked. It was just like the coolest thing I've ever seen. And then there's a kangaroo. I mean, you've got the whole overseas. Everybody thinks that there's kangaroos everywhere and koalas everywhere and all these things. Don't, and Don't spoil it. Don't spoil it. Ah, yeah, we ride kangaroos to school. So I just fell in love with it. And I think Victoria is very unique. It has beautiful temperate rainforests with amazing wildlife and I'm not just talking about birds like I love birds and everything but I love everything else and you've got insane bat species flying foxes first time I saw a flying fox I was shocked it was just the most amazing thing I've ever seen and to me that richness that we have here is so special and and not a lot of people around the world get to experience that so and i mean we're we're really off the track but i think it's nice to talk about that you can be in a big city and you've got the lorikeets that are just we're so attuned to them that we don't even notice them but they are absolutely spectacular the rosellas are spectacular i was just out (laughs) admiring them in, in the park across the road i mean just literally Straight across my street, so I'm talking 25 metres, i got long-billed corellas, little corellas, galahs, a bunch of lorikeets. So I haven't seen a Swifty, peregrine falcons whizzing around, goshawks yeah, around, you- and I live in, I live, what, 28 k's from the city in the west, which is the, certainly not the, it's not like the eastern suburbs where you have tr- lots and lots of big mature trees, lots of cover, gardens that are quite dense. We won't, we don't get fairy wrens over here, for instance, but I do have a pair of lapwings that don't hang out in the park. They've actually taken over a block of land which houses a substation. So there's a bunch of trees and maybe half a dozen maybe 10 mature eucalypts. Otherwise, it's clear. It's got quite a large area of grass. It's in between a service station and a bunch of shops, a strip shop. There's all the electrical stuff and the maintenance guys who are in and out of there all the time are only on the back end of that allotment working on the electrical gear. So the the lapwings the pl- share that open ground with red rump parrots and cockatoos and corellas and all the canopy is all lorikeets and probably four yeah probably four honey eaters what have we got um little wattle birds red wattle birds white eared honey eaters white plumed honey eaters they're the main honey eaters so they're the main things just in that little 
patch of ground patch. between a service station and a strip shops and the a busy four lane main arterial road. Yeah, it, it is. And the thing is that the diversity that you have in cities and suburbs in Australia it is to me it's sometimes shocking because you like you, you see all these birds and they adapt to city life and I I always find it very curious and how they do it it's kind of sad for the ones that don't but there's two sides to that coin though and I don't think there's any evidence to what I'm about to say but I think there are so many Corellas in my suburb and they're just in sort of eight eight kilometer radius. There's this massive flock that moves around. That's because they've been pushed out of where they normally live. So our yeah. destroying the habitat further inland has meant they've got nothing to eat. So they come down here and they I don't mind. They chew up the park. Good on them. They rip it to pieces. But I'm sure the park managers hate it. But I love seeing them and hearing them. They're very yeah. noisy. Yeah, they are very noisy. Like waking up with them in the morning when they start yeah. their morning chit chat, it's a fantastic. Yeah. Book. yeah. Now, I think let's talk about the Lapwing Project. Okay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> we talked about like this was a good old bird nerd conversation. Yeah. We've done the sec. We've done the second half of the show up, but. Let's, oh, but you but, still need to ask me what's my favourite bird guide. Don't ends. worry, we, don't worry, we we're getting there. But let's do the hard science. Let's pretend I know what I'm talking about. Off we go. You do actually. <laughs> so I, I'll tell you a bit about this project and how it came about. So we all experience fear, and we all have humans, wildlife. We all have that fight or flight mechanism. And we know from different research that was done that it, it has some kind of an effect on your behavior, on your physiology, on your well-being. As a human, I'm talking, not just wildlife. And one of the so, – so you asked me before what – kind of scientist I am. So I'm a behavioral ecologist. I am specializing in behavior and physiology. This is my area of interest because they tie together. And a lot of times behavioral ecologists will look at a certain behavior. But when you're designing a project, you're designing to, you, you want to test for one thing and you want to try to eliminate everything around it. And I think in the past few years, a lot of scientists started trying to integrate different approaches to the same problem because we are evolving and we know that a more holistic approach is required to get better conservation outcomes. So, okay. so if we take for a given that certain actions will elicit certain responses, or outcomes, what is the problem or what is the issue that you were investigating that that made you focus on the lapwing. Okay. So, so I think I mentioned that before, but there's a decline of shorebirds globally. And lapwings, my lab at Deakin, the my question lab, we we sometimes use a model species, and a lot of ecologists use a model species to try and answer a certain research question. Just because you you can't get ethics or you don't want to work on sensitive species because they're declining anyway and you don't want to be the person that drives them to extinction. Mm, exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. And you can. And, and we are in an extinction crisis. So... Anything that you can use without with minimizing your impact on other vulnerable species is great. And ecologists for many years have been using model species to try and ask, answer certain questions so they can develop better management, better management programs for protection of not just the common species or the model species, but in general, try to apply it for other things. Now, one of the things, one of the measures of fear and stress 
that are used by especially land managers and anyone that does conservation of shorebirds or even conservation of, of certain mammals. We use a measure of behavior to understand if an animal is habituated or not. And that is called flight initiation distance, which is a very simple concept. You basically, when does the animal that you're studying decides to take off and, and you measure that distance between yourself and that bird. And there you go. That's when you have a flight initiation distance. There are within that model, you of course need to record where you started that approach. What was the angle of that approach? Because for those of those in the audience that don't know a lot about flight initiation distance, there's different angles. So if you go to the park and you see a bird, if you go directly towards it, it will they, they notice the angle. So they, they will probably respond more frantically to you walking towards them rather than if you go and do a tangential approach and even look away. So birds don't, like animals don't get as stressed, not all animals, but it's been shown that animals less get get less stressed by people that are just going parallel to them. So an oblique approach looks to them less threatening than a direct approach, which kind of makes sense. Yeah, yeah it is. And, and I think that's what fascinated me the most about this project because a lot of that is, is actually trying to look at things from the point of view of the animal. I know I'm not trying to anthropomorphize if that did I pronounce well. yeah that's close <laughs> enough we, we all know we, we're not we're not projecting our emotions and feelings and and whatnot onto the animal yeah but if we know that we're affected by stress then why is it not a measure of something when you're managing wildlife and mm-hmm. and it, it is yeah. important because because especially when you look at endangered species and threatened species such as the hooded plover one of the things with the hooded plovers is that their nest failure rate is very high. The chick rearing and and basically fledging rate is very low. So it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time to actually get one chick to fledge from a clutch of three. And stress or so, so if you look at threatened species, stress is a factor especially if you're trying to manage a, a, an endangered species or a threatened species in a way that is effective and will encourage a better outcome. So the methodology of this study was basically you identified nests and you then disturbed them. You walked towards them and you measured what what happened, the angles, the pace. I mean, it was it's a really interesting paper and hopefully people can can get a look at it. I don't know if I'm allowed to link to it, but we'll we'll deal with that later on. Hopefully we can. <laughs> and but it's yeah, it, it's really interesting. But tell us what you found out about the mast lapwing and then how do you think it can apply to other species more globally? All righty. First can I talk about the methodology? Because that was Absolutely. That was really cool. So the previous study, before I did my honours, previous studies used a false egg with a microphone in it to put into birds' nests. Now, the, most of the studies were done on, on penguins, to, especially penguins in area of tourism, to see how they respond to people approaching them. And it is very cool because ground nesting birds when they're breeding and they lay eggs, they develop this cute little brood patch. And that brood patch has is highly vascularized and it creates like this little bold patch that this is how they warm up the eggs, they incubate the eggs. So one of the co-authors, Hayley Glover, she's uh, developed this egg. It has a sensitive microphone in it. And it's camouflaged with the same color of flapwing eggs. And I plugged it into a high sensitive recorder and basically waited for the bird to come and sit on my egg until I can hear 
its heartbeat. So that was the way to test the physiology, the physiological response to my experiment. I had to marry that with a behavioral measure which was uh, basically putting a GoPro close to the nest but not too close so so the bird doesn't get freaked out and it doesn't affect the results of my my experiment and basically synchronize the video and the audio so I'll be able to see the exact time that the bird displays any behavioral cues like alerts or flight and flight can be not just spreading your wings it can be just getting up and walking away from the nest. That's considered Do, flight response. And doing their broken wing act or whatnot. So, yeah. Now, that, now, we hadn't talked about that. I, I was waiting for that. If, you, if you're if you not familiar with the mask of that wing, it's it's, it's like a tall in, – in the size, it's like a long-legged show duck. So they got a sort of – they got a lot – a sort of long body. They're pretty big. I don't know. They're probably 30 – 30 centimetres, 40 centimetres maybe. Between um, 30 and 38, they yeah. weigh anything between 200 and 400 grams. But they're very adroit flyers. They can change direction on almost it, on nothing. They are unbelievably agile and they've got two nasty spurs at the hinge joint of their wings and and they're not afraid to use them i got one in the jaw i've had one in the they're back not- yeah 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 <laughs> there's a myth used- that people think it's their it's venomous like you know that they inject something yeah, with a spur yeah. the spur is made of keratin there's nothing yeah. poisonous or venomous about it it just hurts and when you cop it, get infected if you're not careful. Yeah, if, yeah, if they, you don't treat it well, yeah. yeah. So they will try to distract you and move you away from the nest. But if you are persistent or if they think you are a threat, I think they're more vicious than the Australian magpie when you find yeah, a sw- swing magpie because the magpie will give you generally an opportunity to move away or to. With your eye contact, I think most magpies, and not all, some of them are just habituated to go at you, but they're generally giving you a warning. Get out of the way. Once the plover is, I mean, you can probably probably tell me about this from your results. Once Ooh, I you have get so many stories. Yeah, once you get within a zone, there's no turning back. If you walk away and you are no longer a threat because you're going in the other direction, they're still going to get you. Yeah, it depends. It's It varies between individuals. You've got some individuals that are much more aggro than others and they will get you. Is there a sex difference that you found? It's hard for me to say because I wasn't doing any sexing at all. So some of the mark birds, we know their sex, but a lot of the birds that I studied were not marked. And because it wasn't part of of the research question, then I can't know. But I don't think there is uh, a lot of a difference. I think it's it depends on the bird, it depends on the threat, and it depends on there's so many factors. They won't chase you if you get away from the nest. They will not spend energy trying to chase you. They will leave you. They will continue. Yeah, yeah, they'll continue to yak at you and and scream at you because they're angry, but they will not waste energy if the danger gets out of their way. Pairs have a different area that that they protect aggressively. Like will some make it? A fifty, a fifty meter radius, or will, or will some tolerate you up to twenty five? Or yeah, what, yeah, what do- this is very interesting. So going back to my experimental design, what what I found and what we found when we started looking at the data was that we had three different, like we had two types of responses. And what I mean with two types of responses is you have a group of birds that their response was basically to be startled. And that means that they developed, like they they issued a response, some kind of behavioral or physiological response as soon as they saw me. 
okay, as soon as I started walking towards them. So there's three measures that I was looking at. The, so so the, when you're measuring uh, flight initiation distance, you need to calculate how long you walked towards until that point of flight. So you record the starting distance. You record the distance where the bird shows detection. So when she shows alert or vigilance behavior, and then you record the distance where it flew. And one of the things that we didn't know, and it wasn't really described before on free-living birds, was there is a physiological initiation distance. So there is a distance at which the heart rate starts elevating and it reaches a certain peak. And there is, in some birds, it was very classic. I started walking towards it. They looked alert and then heart rate kicked in and then they flew. So that was a classic response. But we also found that within that group, within the the group of birds, there were three types. I'll go back to the two types, sorry. So there's two, there were two groups of birds. One was the startles. Those are the ones that responded either physiologically or behaviorally to to the experiment immediately. And there was another group that we called them the non-startles. And they're the ones that basically showed the classic I'm starting to walk towards them, they're detecting me, and then they're flying. So within the startle ones, we had three types of responses. We had the ones that the physiological and the behavioral cues are starting at the same time, and then they fly. And then you had physiological startle, and that was the interesting one because those birds saw me, detected me, didn't show any behavioral response but there was a lag between the physiological response to where they actually showed some kind of behavioral response like detection and there was a behavioral startle which was when the behavioral cue was prior to the physiological which means the heart rate elevation response. So that second Um, group sorry that you mentioned the middle group not the classic group, but the middle group. They were Depressing. not showing that. Yeah, so they were not showing any discomfort, for want of a better word, until they and until they were up off the nest and either flying or walking, running away. So is that sounds a bit like the behaviour that we expect from things like snipe or quail that you don't know they're there and then all of a sudden, bang, they're they're, yeah. they're up they're up and away. Yeah, and the thing is, and that was the thing that I was interested in, is what is the cost? Because if you are in a highly stimulated area where people are around all the time and there's disturbance all the time and there's predators, so so one of the unique things about Phillip Island and, and, and that is why the lapwing population is being monitored and studied there is because Phillip Island is predator free, technically. Like it still has feral cats, but there's been a 30 year project of removing foxes and, and Phillip Island has eradicated the foxes from the island. Yeah. I think it was almost four years ago now. Yeah, so it, it's domestic animals <laughs> that, are the chance predators really like that? If cats that they're they're acting like they're feral, but they've actually got a house to go back to, and dogs off leash. Yes, and that comes to responsible pet ownership. With we're we're going to need like an hour just to talk about. Yeah, that. no, we're not even going to go there. But <laughs> keep them inside, keep them on a leash. End of story. So yeah. yeah. So uh, can I ask you? Yes, because Phillip Island has quite a dense that there's a lot of people doing a lot of things there's still some farming going on there's cows walking around in some spots there's obviously people on bikes there's there's people backpacking and whatnot were you studying some nests that were very close to human encroachment and some that were less frequently encountered yes Yes and yes. So Philip Allen, when I did the study, which was almost five years ago, a little shorter than that. Wow, five years. Sorry. So there were a lot of vacant lots in like 
suburban areas like cows or or uh, kepulamai in areas that are close to people's houses and there's a lot of nests that are in paddocks and there's a high variation between individuals there was a study that was done before b- before my project started about the flight initiation distance that there's a difference between rural and suburban birds in their responses unfortunately i wanted to include that question but unfortunately i didn't have a large enough sample size to actually find any effect this is something that would be really cool to do especially with a physiological aspect of that would be really cool to do on as a, an extension of this research but yeah normally like Again, I, I didn't analyze that by landscape, but it was pretty usual to see that rural birds had a much longer flight initiation distance than urban birds. Urban birds tended to, to wait until they understood what was going on. I, I had, speaking of the lapwings that you have around that block, I had a nest of birds that were nesting in a car park outside a pub and basically I could go all the way to the nest almost like a meter away from that nest and the bird would not get up like it would do the whole threatening thing with the spurs out and and scream until I couldn't hear anything else but and that's one of their strategies that they, they, they make your ears ring but but yeah that that bird was just the people that worked in that pub put a chair on top of it so people will not run over the nest because i don't know if the people that are listening to us know how they nest in a very shallow scrape and they usually nest like originally they are a coastal and a shore bird so they should be nesting on vegetation that is coastal like all the little succulents that you you may find in estuaries and and coastal areas the, the noon flower the pig face yeah, yeah the pig yeah. face the noon yeah. flower the, it's i had a, a few nests that were native nests i call them and that was just beautiful but because they're very adaptable and there's water sources further inland and lawns are very well maintained, their strategy is when they nest on the ground, they need a 360 view of what's around them because they need to suss the approach of predators or dangers. And that's how they defend their nest. So with shorebirds, especially ground nesting birds, there's a different there's a difference of different approach. So mass lapwings will be a lot more aggressive. So they will use their spurs, they will swoop you, and they will call really loudly. Hooded plovers are a lot more passive. They will try to steer, both of them will try to steer you away from the nest, yeah. but they'll have different strategies on how they do that. So hooded plovers will feign that broken wing and they'll call like do distress calls where lap wings one of them will do the fanning broken wing thing but the other one will swoop the daylights out of you yeah. and until you just like i've seen lap wings chase away wedgetail eagles and when i was a kid it wasn't always one walking away and one swooping you they will tag team you in the air I yeah yeah it. some of them do the dive bombs like yeah. a- again it's very individual the behavior varies between the individuals so what you've got some really interesting results in in terms of the the physiological response and then the the action that flows from it but what have you been able to discover that you can put into a management plan or that you can recommend to managers, say, for instance, a park manager with a la- large suburban areas that are not intensive parks, but meadows, maintained meadows, for want of a better description. And let's extend it. Let's see what what can you write down and send to the the hooded plover recovery team <laughs> or the managers of the beaches and the estuaries where there are breeding populations of that bird. 
Okay, so I'll start with your last question. With your last question, I can't really say because this is a study that not many studies were done. So we need more research on different taxa to be able to actually extrapolate that in a more general way. But from the point of view of the studies and, and the interesting results that we got, like I, I mentioned that we had two types of responses, the non-startles and the startles. But within that, we had animals that responded physiologically with longer duration of heart rate elevation. That means energetic costs. Now, if you take into consideration food availability, habitat availability, and uh, disturbance, that is like a triple whammy for some sensitive for, animal. For sick, yeah. Yeah. So we, was there a bigger, big enough sample size or was it a long enough scope, the time, to be able to determine? I mean, it's really hard to quantify because you've got the three different groups in how they respond, but were you able to infer anything about success to fledging or even to hatching, anything like that? that? That is something that I would love to do as a PhD because this is like this is something that you need to design a big, big study. And, and it's important for people who are listening to understand that your study had built on a previous study and now we need people in North America, in Europe, and the hoodie team or somebody who loves hoodies and gets some funding to build on what you've done so that we can really zero in on the particular issues that each population will have. Yeah, and that that is like we're standing on the shoulders of giants. So, that- so for this specific paper I was looking at what was done around the world and there's a lot of things that were done around the world in regards to that for example on American oyster catchers but they had a different response like from a heart rate elevation they had a different r- response with lap wings they had tachycardia so basically the, their their heart rate just shot yeah. through the roof and so if they're responding like that and land managers, so the, the key things that we found was that, first of all, you've got a positive association between the age of the clutch and the response of the bird, so and the duration of the heart rate eleva- elevation. So what does that mean? That means that birds that invested more time in incubation and the closer the chicks are to hatching, the eggs are to hatching, then the birds will try to protect those eggs as much as they can because they invested a lot of time in it and a lot of effort in it. Because just so so the listeners will understand a little bit about their behavior and the biology, mass lapwings, as much as everybody hates them, they're the best parents in the world and they're very equal parenting. So Who hates lapwings? I met people, (laughs) like most people, they're just like, yeah, some people don't really like them. But anyway, they're very equal parents. So males and females sit, share the load 50-50 and and they're fantastic. So this swooping and everything is they're protecting their kids. So And it makes sense because the later that it is in the brood cycle, the less chance they have of having a second clutch and being successful if they lose the nest. So yeah, so that and, makes perfect sense. Exactly. And usually they have one or two attempts a year, depending. And, and again, breeding season, like I know we're talking very specific stuff, but we also need to back out to the bigger picture. So you've got habitat loss, you've got climate change, so precipitation changes and for example, lapwings depend on earthworms and soil invertebrates to feed. And only when the soil is full of food, that's when they'll start breeding and lay their eggs. So that's why you see them laying eggs during between May and October, because those are the wet months. Climate change brings a different cycle of 
precipitation. So that means food availability is not the same. Animals, different species respond to those changes differently. So they may have only one attempt. And if they lose, if they miss out on that, then that's it for the year. And then usually they have one or two clutches a season, but that's it. And that's why they also have this, they, they lay an average size of four, four eggs. But at the end of the day, like what we found is that the older the clutch is, the longer the bird will sit there and defend it and won't show, like there's going to be a lag between the physiological response that their heart rate is exploding, but their behavior, they're suppressing their behavior, which is very interesting because if you think about it, it could be that your birds in the, your backyard are not really okay that you're there. So, or some of them won't be okay that you're there. Another thing, so so like you mentioned before, then that suggests that parental investment is a factor. But again, we didn't have the time to test it. But also behavioral tolerance can be associated with physiological cost because if you sit there and your heart rate elevates, you're burning a lot of energy. And not only that, if that happens frequently, then that could have a detrimental effect on your physiology and your well-being and your ability to do your thing, basically. Well, that, so it will affect your body condition. That's a really important finding, I think, for managers, for managers of open space, because if you are, let's say, mowing on a on a very regular cycle, frequency cycle, and keeping a manicured area, and you have a resident pair who are nesting, the fact that they stay on the nest, it you would probably infer from that that they're pretty cool with me being here, where it's completely the opposite. So that we probably need to adjust Parks and Gardens management a little bit in light of, of these findings, and obviously you need to, or somebody needs to build on this and extend it. But Yeah, so, so that's what we're suggesting in our paper. So we're suggesting that, of course, you need more research. Like you can't infer these things definitively from, mm. from our findings, but what those findings suggest, what – the, the fact that there is a physiological cause then or a potential of it, then that means that currently land managers, they are using flight initiation distance, which is a behavioral measure of tolerance, mm. and it may not be sufficient. So, for example, when you plan a park and you plan a bicycle trail, okay, close to shorebirds uh, breeding ground, okay, if you use only flight initiation distance to an alert distance, because basically if, if the bird flew, then you're too late, okay? So you yeah. need to, to find a buffer, what we call buffer zone, between where it shows an alert to where it flies and you do all these statistical analysis on the population and you find this golden number of how much distance you need between your trail and that breeding ground. Because but, what the manager is seeing is the bird taking off or running away and they're thinking about that being the important measure, but they yeah, aren't they're considering, using... they're not considering the the success rate of the clutch that and the indication or the, the trigger for that, as you're explaining, is not the distance that from when they fly because the hypertension and then the actual activity of bre of brooding, of incubating, yeah. has is either lessened or perhaps even becomes, I don't know, maybe it's too hot. I don't know. Yeah, and the thing is that so, so the way that land managers and in general they do that, they use the alert behaviour, like when a bird or an animal is vigilant as an indicator. So what we showed was that basically this may not be like we need a more holistic approach and it depends on the species and it varies between individuals. But it's not only that, but 
it also means if you look at it, like if you take a step back and you look at it from a population level, that means that in the long term, from an evolutionary perspective, the population will probably select more bold birds rather than, and the shy birds are going to be selected away. Or driven further away. Yeah, yeah. or driven further away. So you're changing the population structure, genetic structure and behavioural structure, and that can be an issue. And again, it, it, it depends on what you're trying to do and what you're trying to protect. But, but now, just going to say, we, we need to draw a close to this, just to this section, because there's so much, there's so much that needs to be known for it to be applied to standard management practice for either agriculture or development or recreation, countless. Or even um, like even mudflats and like I've got this amazing mangrove reserve next next door, which is fabulous. And the good thing is that it's a very protected area, but there's some areas that are much more well traveled. Yeah. And and this is a very small honours project that requires mm-hmm. development. And, I mean, municipal bodies are going to probably be interested in this, I, w- I would have thought, in the, in the future. And beyond that is all those issues about the disturbances for, in our particular case, the, the hooded plover and the competing uses for beaches. But then you've got the Northern Hemisphere with things like the mowing of meadows and all those kind of issues. So, yeah. Yeah, we have the same. We lose nests because people mow them. I had land managers that were working with me. And to be honest, before we wrap up this, I would like to thank my supervisory team, Associate Professor Mike Weston and Dr. Peter Dan and the co-authors Hayley Glover and Daniel Lees like, and Anthony Rendell, that they all contributed to, to, to this work. But, yeah, when you think about it, there's so many factors that we need to think when we're doing threatened species management and threatened ecosystem management. And I think in this specific podcast Fiona talked about it Linda Bell talked about it you need a holistic approach you need to conserve the habitat you need to make sure that you're doing weed management and plant management and 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 making sure that the, all and you need to protect all the spaces it's not just about one you you need that holistic approach and i think what this paper shows is that a lot of those measurements of habituation and, and, and if an animal is considered disturbed or not are actually maybe not accurate. Maybe there is a more accurate way of measuring it and that mm. needs to be factored in because physiology goes always with behaviour, like you can't separate them. And, so, and, and we interpret what we observe as a land manager, as a, which we've discovered is not the case. So we've got so deep in the weeds that I hope people are able to take away the, the complexities. I mean, we've jumped all over the place, but we, <laughs> hopefully they've, they've understood that this is a small study, but you've got some significant results that are contradictory to what the casual observer would think would be the case. I think that's where we can leave it. That's the key thing. Yeah. I've learned, sorry, I've learned two things, that pied oyster catchers in North America are pretty chilled out dudes compared to our stress head mass lap wings in Australia. Uh, But that may be related to the fact that pied oyster catchers uh, nest on rocks and they know that humans can never go close mm. enough to their nest, whereas these guys nest in your backyard yeah that's right so so and hopefully people can see why the research done on a common species or a very familiar species can sometimes be applied and overlaid on to the projects that are being done elsewhere on the far more threatened and um on the brink species so hopefully you've all got that that link now the fun stuff alona but before the fun stuff, there's one more thing. Okay. With the physiology, and that's the uniqueness of this study, is that 
because we used a microphone and high sensitive bioacoustics in that, it's non invasive. In the past, people were plugging electrodes to measure heart rate. So that's an also, it's a very important mm-hmm. thing that you it, want it, to do ethical research. Yeah, ethically, this is far superior. And I'd like to talk to the egg lady. There's a few papers. So so initially it came from, I don't know if you read of Melissa Gizzi. She, no. she's, I think she's currently working in, in the biodiversity team in New South Wales Department of Primary something. In, not Planning, primary. Planning industry, industry, which is but Linda's. She's done, she initially started with that, with a, an egg, and Haley constructed that, but not with infrared, but with a microphone. Anyway. There's it's fascinating. So it's fascinating how the costs are coming down to enable the application of some of those things. I mean, it's just like speaking to to Daniela about the glossies and the bio bioacoustics that we just did ah. a couple of weeks ago. That's right. It's now affordable. Or even look, there's one I've got coming up. Open source. Um, you can find yeah. like you've got Anabat that costs heaps of money and you've got open source stuff to record the back calls and you can do whatever you want with it. Even camera traps are now affordable. There's an episode coming up, which I won't spill the beans, but we were talking about a hundred camera traps at a hundred bucks each. Now that's, sorry, at a thousand bucks each. That's in the past. Yeah. But today it's like, I mean, that just completely limits what you can actually discover. So no, yeah. it's great. It's great. It's awesome. Let's uh, hopefully it just keeps coming down. So we'll put the we'll we'll put the lap wings to bed for the moment. Okay. <laughs> we look we could, but then and then everyone will be uh, I, I I have a thing like I think one of the things that I love being in Australia is that we're all rooting for the underdog. And yeah, and I have a thing for Lap wings, just because they're so misunderstood. I did promise on the last Plover Appreciation Day that where we did our worldwide panel that we would do it again and that we would expand it. So I think, Alona, you're going to have to be involved in that one, and we'll we can talk lap wings. That's a lot fantastic! More, it would be my pleasure and a great honour. So yeah, thank so, you. I would love to come. Sign me up. <laughs> we did have a bit of fun on that. So yeah, look back into the earlier podcast because we did do that uh, live stream where we were in the middle of the no- middle of the night here in Australia and talking to people in the northern hemisphere talking plovers. So that was great. Now hit us with your answer. Your field guide of choice. Simpson and Day. Simpson and Day. Are you using are you using a hardcover book or are you migrating to the use of apps? So Simpson and Day, I don't think it came out on an app. No, There's the that's... most recent one that is not a Simpson and Day, the the Birds of Australia, that, which is yep. fantastic. But Simpson and Day, and and I've got a I've got a little story about it. Okay, so that was my first bird guide. Okay, first bird book I've ever purchased in my life was Simpson and Day, the latest edition. I think it's ninth or something like that, and it's the last one. Because you went, you went from Cat Five Cables for Dummies to to Field Guides of Australia Field Guides. I like that move exactly. So I bought that when I was at uni. And then when I finished my honours, I told you I started to work at Phillip Island Nature Parks and I started working at the parade as a ranger. And then one day, one of the rangers like, oh, Nicholas Day is working here. And I love, I love the illustrations. Like, it's so beautiful. And I was like, what do you mean Nicholas Day? Like Nicholas Day from Simpson and Day? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, Oh my God, he's a rock star <laughs> in the bird world. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I met him and he's a good friend and he's a beautiful human and he's so talented. So, and I even got him to sign and sign my book, which was a huge thing for me. So, yeah, so that's my favorite book. That, and that's the story around yeah. that. Yeah. So, the, the, the purpose of the question with the app is that even though not all the field guides have got an app associated with them that more and more people are taking a tablet out 
and are then using whatever is available. So, but if um, you don't have reception, what do you well, do then? I'm old school. I've stored the whole thing on here and I can play the calls and so that, without that receptions. So Which all... one is your favourite, if I may ask? I know you're interviewing um, me, but I'm curious. I haven't really shared my philosophy of life, but I've try, I have try to have my whole life apart from furniture, which, you know, is always secondhand and whatnot and can be left behind if you leave. My, life, fit, my life fits into my recording gear, my computers to and everything to produce the podcast go into yep. a large flight case and a satchel and then I have a backpack and I have a large a large suitcase so that I can go and get on a flight and not pay excess luggage and that's my life so yeah, so true. so if something if I'm getting something new something has to go so if I buy a new very good philosophy that's how I'm trying to live my life I mean if you ever follow me on Twitter you know that I think we're totally drowning in bullshit and there's a whole lot of stuff you don't need and talk the talk walk the walk so bear with me this is my field guide oh uh, it's awesome which is the Slater Field Guide, and I've hung on to this one because my first field guide, and I've told the story before, was the Peter Slater Field Guide to Australian Birds, Volume 1 and 2. I had number one, which was all the non-passerines, and I waited years and years for the second volume to come out. But, you know, they're too bulky. This one for me is great. I'm, I love it. I frequent a library that has all the others. And on the on the phone, let me just check because we look at these things all the time and forget actually what good. the name of them is. So it's Ozbirds and it's the Morecambe and uh, – Morkum and what's the name? So yeah, yeah, that's right. So we've all got that, and I'm trying to get into. I mean, I haven't been habituated to the citizen science stuff, but I've got uh, big city birds on the on the phone that I'm trying to use, and of course, I've got a field recorder and whatnot. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try and do more with recording the calls and, and yeah, like this is one of my favorite things to do to just sit yeah. somewhere and listen to the calls but, and try to test but, myself but i also don't think we should reinvent the wheel and xena Cantor is just amazing and i mean there's so many people of building resources for everyone to re refer to like you say open source we got creative commons we just should appreciate the work that so many people do i mean yeah, so that I mean, I'm I, I'm in your part of the the show, but you asked me the question. There we are. That's, Thank you. That was a really good. Answer. <laughs> but I don't have a favourite, and I do far less birding now than I did. I'm always in my area because every other day I'm speaking to someone like you who's got real knowledge, and I just listen to it. So yeah, but I, I do have plans for a, for a big year. When we're allowed to travel yeah, around. Yeah, when we're and, allowed to travel. But that's the but, beauty about birding. You can do it yeah. outside your in your and, backyard. And it's not a big year to amass numbers. My plan is to visit a whole heap of researchers or practical managers on site and do a community show, get the school awesome. with everyone. So that's what I'm working towards. And not only are we going to do it in Australia, we're going to go and hang out with the Philippines Eagle and, and the Okinawa Woodpecker. And so so I've got the I've got this fantasy that somebody's going to give me a whole lot of corporate money just to do something dumb like that. But we'll anyone that can hear us now, please <laughs> contribute to this pod. What Grant does is really important. We, we're, we're a long way we're a long way from having that solidified, but yeah, that's something I would like to do is to take you instead of once a year with the with the Pine of Science sort of project, I'd like to take people to the locations where they can actually see the birds or see the habitats and hear and so but I mean oh god. Insurance insurance. Insurance. Oh yeah, true. True. We it's, can do uh, it locally. Yeah, it's just a yeah. But anyway, tell me your favourite bird, Alana. That is a very difficult question. And the reason being is because I have a favourite for different taxa groups. 
Okay. I mean, it's a long form podcast. I mean, people are just going to yeah. switch off or they're not. So let's hear your reasoning. Okay. I, hope, I hope you're not going to go through every family. No, but I divided it into a few big groups. So okay. are we talking seabirds, waders, bush birds, or have we got my favourite gallinule is my Yeah, no, I didn't go that far. But, but yeah, but so I, I kind of did like from the passerines in Australia, and I'm talking about Australia, okay, because so, it can, I've got, it's hard to pick. Like they're all so yep. awesome. And in general, like it's not just, that I'm a bird dog, but I love all animals and I love, and mammals are awesome as well. But well, with birds, it's really easy to track them and monitor their behavior and just observe. I think Fiona mentioned that she just likes observing. And that's what I do. I, I love observing birds. So make it a long story short. Passerines in Australia, favorites, Aussie magpies. They just, you, you can't, you just, can't, they're just so intelligent. Um, and fairy wrens. I love fairy wrens. They're just so animated. And the males are so dapper. And the females are just so adorable. So, yeah, fairy wrens. First time I saw a fairy wren, I was just a male fairy wren. I was mesmerized by the color. Now, that, that gives me the opportunity to say that one, I was introduced to someone to do a pint of science program on the fairy wrens, but they're out doing field work, so we can't actually do them in the right week. But oh, that's that's coming up. There's actually got a couple about fairy wrens coming up. That's fantastic, yeah. and the fact that they're called superb, they are yeah. superb. That's fascinating. I'm gonna I'm gonna track it. It's yeah, parrots. We're still national. <laughs> I've got galahs and yellow-tailed black cockatoos. Uh, I think they're just galahs. They're just so playful. The fact that they can swing on a wire and just hang upside down, I think it's just amazing. And they're so smart. And crimson rosellas are just stunning. And yellow-tailed black cockatoos are stunning. So birds of prey. Birds of prey. Wedge-tailed eagle. Which are legal Easy. Black-shouldered um, kite. Yes. Yep. Seabirds, penguins, penguins, surprise, surprise, and shearwaters, short tailed shearwaters are so, so underappreciated. And it's one of the most fascinating birds I've ever had a chance to work with. They're fantastic, they're fabulous, and we can have a whole show about them. Uh, I've, yes. But not the Phillip Island ones is coming up. There's something coming up soon. To oh, cool. Fantastic. Oh, my so, God. I'm going to be plugged into your podcasts all the time. Shorebirds, other than hoodies and lapwings, which are like lapwings take everything, okay? Eastern curlers and ruddy turnstones because they're just – Eastern curlers, like they migrate for so such huge distances. It's, it's amazing. Did, and did you know that we have three episodes – of Eastern Curlew? Yes, I oh, saw sorry. that. I didn't get a chance to, to listen to it, but, yes, I saw that and I was like, yes. Um, and overseas birds, so now I'm, I'm going overseas and this is going to be short, okay? So I've got the hoopoe. Yeah, it's the national bird of Israel. And when I and grew up, there were heaps of them around. Now not as much and they're just amazing. And if Beautiful. you if you're a Twitter user, I'll just butt in there. Get on Bird Twitter or Ornithology hashtag Ornithology hashtag Bird Twitter hashtag Photography. They're going crazy over the hoopoe in the UK because this they've arrived. So, so, you, so if you're not familiar with it, just fire up your Twitter Twitter feed and you will see heaps and heaps of pictures of people. Because they're popping into everyone's gardens or their local meadow or whatnot at the moment. So that's great. Yeah, they're amazing. They're amazing. And last one is red cap mannequin, just because they know how to dance. And the puffin didn't get a go. It's really hard. I cannot. Like, you asked for one favourite bird and I gave you a list of, because I can't pick. Yeah. Okay. So what's so let's do the let's do the bucket list bird now. Oh, bucket list bird? And, and I would, you're limited I would to love one to here. go to Antarctica and and see penguins in Antarctica. That's okay. that's you know that's a life. Goal. I want to see the and, yeah, I want to see the former down there. So yes, I is. think well, I think you just told us your bucket list location in that answer. So we've got that one there. Where's the best place that you've been for 
burning or because you're a broad vision ecologist, where's the best place you've been to do your sciencing? Best place I've been to do my sciencing. Wow. That's Phillip Island has a, a very warm place in my heart. One of my favorite places is the rainforests of Tasmania. I was very fortunate to volunteer there studying Tassie devils. And it's just, I uh, know, no, that was a long, long while ago. But yeah, I, I wish I had time in the last year to join Dr. David, but, but he's, I can't fly to Tasmania. And so it's a bit of a problem. Yeah. But it's, yeah, I would love to do that again. Like I love devils and I love quolls. I think they're just superb. So yeah, Western Tasmania, rainforest, temperate rainforest, beautiful, magical spot and the magnificent australasian beach what a great yeah. what a great plant yeah. yeah all right we've got around and round and round on all these questions but what's your favorite piece of gear when you're out and about okay so i'm not going to be original because i'm going to join fiona and say gators and I'm going to join Linda and say binos. So oh, no. for field work, gaiters and pants with lots of pockets, that's a must. And for recreation, a pair of binos and I'm a happy little Vegemite. Now, are you maintaining a list? No, actually, no, I should because I've been in different places and looked at different birds. Like I've been to Costa Rica and, and the, the diversity of birds there is just amazing and I didn't keep a list. But, but you know, to me it's more of the fun hmm. detection, trying to just sit in the middle of a forest or on a rocky outcrop or something like that and just listen to to the sounds and, and try to identify or if I see something amazing and no you're so you're the immersive birder and you are you are up my end of the spectrum. Yay but, more people Yeah. It's interesting that what I'm finding is that the people doing research tend not to be fanatical list keepers it tends to be the hobbyist for it's and that's the wrong sort of term but it's the the birds bird nerds for pleasure let me put it that way yeah, even yeah, though that there's so much there's so much overlap but yeah, yeah because we do lists of other things like for example when you're an ecologist you, you want to expand your knowledge as much as you can just because you really love what you do. And when you go out and you do your research and you do your study, you're like, yeah, I'm focusing on one species, but it's not just about that. And I think a lot of people that you interviewed in this podcast were saying the same thing. The brown birds, no one talks about them. And you usually have a lot of exposure to charismatic species, mm -hmm. but, but, there's less appreciation to everything that enables that charismatic species to actually exist because they're not there by themselves. Mm. They need habitat, they need vegetation, they need other species, they need pollinators, they need it's such a complex, beautiful symphony of things that it's hard to get attached to one thing because we just need to look at it as a whole, if if that oh. makes sense or went on a tangent. Per Perfect, perfect sense. And that's really what we're part of what we're trying to do. And certainly what I'm always banging on about on Twitter is that we have to be, we have to be out there talking about that holistic approach that the old way of project, of funding a study into one species or a protection measure for one species just won't cut it. We have to protect broad scale yeah, total threats. habitat. Yeah, there's too many threats. And with the threat of climate change and habitat loss and human sprawl and, like, even now COVID made it a lot more mm -hmm. relevant because mm -hmm. with logging and, mm -hmm. and destroying forests, you have mm -hmm. more disease, more chances, mm -hmm. it's more likely that disease is going to jump to humans. So there's, it's just too complex to focus on one tiny little angle. That's the key. The interactions are far more complex than we understand. 
most of the interactions we don't actually even know about. And we, yeah, we just can't make decisions on assumptions and that's not good enough yeah. anymore. And I think that, and, and I think this is why SciComm is so important because mm. I think as human, we like certainty and there is, and everything that we do in research is about level of uncertainty. Mm. And I think by communicating to the public, we like having a conversation around the levels of uncertainty and why it is better to actually act and do conservation because in the long run it's going to be actually cheaper and cost less tax money and be a lot less harmful or all, all these things. So if you think of long-term conservation goals and strategies, even if they're not if you don't have a lot of definitive evidence, but if you do that, you can actually in the long run not just improve the community or improve habitat or protect more national parks, but also you're preventing a lot of issues that can happen just because of everything, all the complex threats that you have around you. So It's, it's yeah. easier to hang on to something and not, and preserve it than to try and replace it. That's, that's exactly because the extinction the main is message. forever. And that's one of my lectures in at uni yeah. always said extinction is forever. And it's true, it's forever. Mm. That's it. You don't see it after that. And you've got the dodo behind you. That that's right. I might be swapping the dodo out soon, but of course the whole idea of the dodo behind me is that when they were discovered, they were pretty common. They were everywhere. And then yeah, and how cool it would be if we could have seen it. That's right. But within, I think it was within two generations, uh, within 30 years, I think they were basically gone. It can happen very quickly. So we're preaching to the converted. Alona, thanks for being the guest. Thanks for thanks. Pint of Science or Pint of Scientists for hooking us up. And I hope that there's much more or well, heaps and heaps of activities that people can get into apart from listening to podcasts in the years to come with that program. Now, what would you like people to do? What would you like to promote? Do you want them to follow you anywhere on the socials or do you just want them all to enrol in Extinction is Forever at Deakin University? I, I would love for people to follow me on Twitter. It's just my name, A underscore Cheruvi. But also I, I want people to develop appreciation to what we've got. I would like to inspire people, and this is why I enjoy teaching at Deakin, because I want to inspire the connection to our natural world and our native animals and our native vegetation. We are very lucky here in Australia. There's other places that face huge problems, not as affluent economies as we do and conservation is very low in the priority over here we, we are lucky we've got a yeah. good functioning economy we can we can fund more conservation we can care about things and join your local land care group right? just yeah. do something around your area that 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 would be fantastic and well that's the key phrase can't do everything but we can do something. So I just want to encourage people to do something. At the moment, I think it's really important that we have conversations with people who are not already tuned in on the wavelength that we all are. So that's what I'd like you to do. I'd also like you to subscribe to the show and to share it. And if you like what we're doing, or even if you don't, I'd love you to review us. It's really easy to do in the show notes. I'll have a link. It's just one click and it'll take you to whatever you're listening, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or CastBox or Stitcher or whichever. It'll take you to the easiest way to do a review. You don't have to tell you don't have to give us five stars. I'd just like to know what you think of the show, what you think of the guests, what you find useful, and I don't know, 
one of the other podcasts I do, which Alona, we might try and get you on that one too, because you're quite relevant to the subject matter on that podcast. But oh, I'd love that. I'd love it. But- <laughs> this was one of the best experiences I had in a while. So I, I really enjoyed it. And I have to say to everyone that's watching, Grant is awesome. Your podcast is promoting the science and doing it in a way that is relatable. So I love it and keep on doing this. You're doing a very important job. I'm always friendly on the podcast. If you want to see me being a bit bullshy and radical, you can follow me on Twitter at Bird Emergency and I can tell you sometimes I don't, I can't stand some of the bullshit that's around. Oh, I shouldn't swear because then we don't get into China or India. We've really pushed it. There's a couple of people who are still stuck with us, so thanks very much. My my headphone, just sorry about that. That's probably one of my friends and one of your friends, so good. Before we go, I have to thank Phillip Island Nature Parks, Deakin University. My honours research, I got a scholarship from Deakin University to do that, which is fantastic and it kept me afloat. And again, without funding, we can't do this work. We just can't. I'd like to thank my co-authors, my supervisory team, Mike Weston and Peter Dan and and Anthony and Haley and Dan. And whew, that's it. I think if I forgot anyone, please forgive me. Can I take the piss so, out now? Yeah, sure. I'd like to thank the Academy. Give know, the right it, credit. Oh, and Pine I, of Science. People and, follow Pi on a sign. Yeah. And, of course, I'll have a link for that too. Not, none of this work is done in isolation, and I want the general community to understand that when you talk about getting a grant, they're not big. I saw, I saw the other day that there were $51,000 grants up, up for grabs in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, so there were 50 on offer. They got over 500 applications, and that wouldn't even pay for the petrol for... Yeah, that uh, wouldn't the, even pay for equipment. That, that uh, Yeah, uh, and you have no. to, like, for example, this thing, like I was working with massive data sets because I needed to count heartbeats. Hmm. I wouldn't be able to do that without my volunteers. Like, no. All this work is done for free, and people have to understand that that we're constantly allocating money to consultants and the amount of money sloshing around in government. But then so much of this key work, and it's not only in conservation, it's in a whole lot of stuff. Think of all, there's just too many, that relying on free work and, well, look, I just get frustrated. This is, <laughs> but this is why this is important. Pine of science is important because at the end of the day, it's public opinion that changes these priorities. So if people will think that conservation is an important thing, then they will push for that change. And I think that's what we're all trying to achieve. So for listening to me. Get out there and be a hero for the environment in your own way. There's so many different ways to do it. It can be as simple as just sending this podcast off to annoy every one of your conservative or liberal National Party friends or, no, put me in touch with someone who's doing great work and we'll we'll share the message because that's the only reason I'm here. So this has been the Bird Emergency. I've been teasing it for a long time. We're nearly there with the website. I can promise you it won't just be one picture and a link. It's actually a fair bit of work going into it. And we're following up on the people who have been in previous episodes and some of the episodes that I recorded quite a while ago and are only just getting dribbled out now. We're up to update time and the updates will be posted on the on the web page. And geez, we might even start doing something, a regular sort of streaming session, which has got a looser format and we do a few more panels and questions and answers. So again, if you're reviewing, you can tell us whether you're interested in that. Because I'd like to make I'd like to be able to talk to more and more people. And yeah. So Thanks, Alina. It's been terrific to meet you and to learn about the the mass lapwing. No one should hate the mass lapwing. It, we just need to understand that when they're breeding, they are very temper, temperamental, and we now know why, and we can explain what they're doing. So. Exactly. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me here. It was a, an absolute pleasure. So longer, longer than normal, dear listener. 
Thanks for sticking with us. Dear listeners, I love it when we're streaming and people watching all the way through. That tells us that bird stuff has got an audience. Thanks so much. See you next time. I'm Grant Williams. This is The Bird Emergency. Bye. This is The Bird Emergency. Bye.